Okay, so um, I am Tim Otten, and I drew those little colored arrows on the slide. Wait. <laughs> okay, now, uh, more seriously, I work for the CBCR core team. I have a focus on uh, architecture, infrastructure, developer API type issues. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about City Connect. Uh, to explain Civic Connect, I'm going to start out with the user story. What is the problem that it's trying to solve? And then a demo of how it works, and maybe drill down a little bit on the technology behind it. Okay, so we'll do a user story. There's a the user. Looks kind of happy. Alright, so, user story. Someone wants to send a mail blast. They haven't used Civic before, so they go and they download Civic CRM from the website. Then they extract the tarballs. That's what you should do. And hopefully they're reading the um, documentation, or at least they've read the first ten lines or so, <laughs> far enough to see that they need to go to a special config screen to run the installation. And they've figured out the database and username and password for Civi and for Drupal. Got that all set up. They logged in. They went to the menu for mailings. They said new mailing. They typed in my first mailing and use the template because it actually takes a while to type in good name. And um, they hit, they schedule it, they hit send, and <laughs> now they look at the clock. It's supposed to go out at what? 3.25. And they're watching the clock. It's kind of a bright new day because they've just installed some CRM. It's you know, good self. We're going to change the world there. Um, and they check their email client and there's no email. 326 comes, no email. Okay, fine. Let's go to Google. Let's search mailing not sent. That's kind of a hard thing to search for not getting email in your inbox. But there are ways you can do it. You can maybe search for city mail not sending or something like that. And if they're lucky, they'll come across a page which says, hey, you need to set up a cron job. And hopefully they understand what a cron job is. Um, and they find that the page says, your cron job needs to be a pointer to this URL with a name and a password for some user account. So they go into Drupal because they, they know Drupal pretty well. And they make a new user account, set up, they don't want to use their own user account, right? That, that would require revealing their personal password. It has to be a dedicated account because that's more secure. Um, and then they go back and they wait to see if the cron job fires. They check their email. There's no message. So let's go back to Google. Let's do another search. And hopefully we come across a page which explains that you can't just use any user account. The user account has to have certain permissions. You have to have permissions to see the mailings and see the contacts who are receiving the mailings. Okay, so we make a new role and grant the permissions to the role. Go back to the cloud. Wait a minute. Ron should fire, but there's still no email. Again, hopefully they find something that points out that Civi has its own cron system for enabling and disabling jobs. Um, and one of those jobs is very important to sending out emails. So they go in, they find the screen, they enable the job, back to the clock. The perspective is starting to get a little bit weird here because they've gone through several cycles of this and I, I, yeah, it plays tricks on your mind. You wait and still no email. Search again. This time they find out they need to configure the outbound email. Their web server wasn't properly set up to do it by default. They have to put in an SMTP username and password. So they probably got to go back to their cPanel or their web host and ask them what the username and password are for the SMTP server. But that's okay, they figure it out. They fill it in. And now finally, they get the mailing sent. Yay! Unfortunately, this is not the only place where a new administrator has to go through that kind of process. There's a similar process when you set up the return channel to track the bounces to your emails. There's another process when you set up uh, mapping and geocoding, when you set up SMS integration. So I, I've tried to give this process a name. It's a scavenger hunt. It's basically running around Google and different pages on your server and finding all the data and getting it into Civi so that it knows how to talk to it. There's a good reason 
why people have to go through this. And it's because Civi is a very open, very flexible system. Uh, it's designed where you can plug it in anywhere and you can use any, any email server with it. But every email server is a little bit different and that means you have to put in details about that server. So I, I tried to make up a kind of goofy little maxim about the, uh, the scavenger hunt. All right, so uh, Civi Connect. What does it do? How does it make that better? Let's do a quick demo. So right now, Civi Connect is a feature in uh, version 4.6, I think it was maybe, maybe added in 0.67, um, but it's a hidden feature because it's kind of new and it, you need trials and you need real services using it. Um, I've set up a replica of the entire network on my local machine because I don't trust the Wi-Fi. That's why you see security errors here because my local machine has not followed all the security practices that a proper installation would. But basically, you go to this page for a list of available connections, and you see there's a cron service, there's an email service, and there's this site profile service. We can talk about that more if you like. But um, if we want to connect to this mail service, we get a pop-up, and let's see what it's about. The Acme Mail Service specializes in mail delivery for City Sierra. Okay, so that means they understand the outbound and the return channel, and they do whitelisting and all of that. This email service requires some access to our system. It's an external server. When we connect to it, we're giving them some special privileges on our system. And those pr privileges, I don't think, are very onerous. They make sense if you're sending out mail that the system will be able to see the mailings. Um, they do need to update the mail settings, but that's kind of what we're trying to automate here. What does that really mean? In particular, the system will be able to access the Civi API to create a new setting for the mailing backend. It can modify the SMTP server. It will be able to process mailings, and it will be able to get a listing of the pending mail jobs. It will not be able to modify the mailings or access any contact data or phone data, just the, the general mailing info. Okay, so we hit continue, and now it's connected. So what does that mean? It means we've sent a message to the Acme Mail Service, and now the Acme Mail Service has us on their file. So if I go to source CSN app, this is, uh, this is a simulation of the other server that has just received our message. And on that server, we can do connection get, and we see, hey, there's a list of two sites which have previously connected to Acme Mail. Now this is a, a little unfortunate for me because I, I, I did this earlier as a test and then wiped away the test completely. And so I'm actually not sure which of these two <laughs> is really connecting to it. But that's okay. Uh, I think we can figure it out. So each connection has its own randomly generated unique ID. And normally, each of these connections would have a different corresponding URL. But in this case, we're dealing with that particular connection. If I say, send a call to that connection for mailingjob.get, which is one of the listed options, it returns a normal API response with the is error, the list of values, the count. There are no pending jobs, so it's empty. Uh, but what if I try to be sneaky and get a list of the full mail IDs? The request does not have any active API authorizations. All right, what if I try to get the contact list? The request does not match any API authorizations. And 
setting dot, what if I want to read their old email config? The request does not match any authorizations because when we authorize it, we only authorize permission to modify the settings. Um, So that's the demo, the technology, what's going on under the hood with some of the stuff. How do you, how do you get to City Connect? How do you get to the demo? Ah, the the, I searched around for it, couldn't find <laughs> So this is not, so right now you have to go to some site that's running 4.6.9 uh, or a very recent release and manually type in this address <coughs> or uh, hash CXN. Uh, you would actually get an empty screen because there are no public services that have been offered for City Connect right now. So City Connect needs to be supported by the service provider, does it? Yes. Say the person who's providing you without outbound this MTP service. Exactly. So out of the box, I mean, it might make sense for someone like City SMTP who right. specializes in City mail delivery to set this mm -hmm. service up. So the first thing is that the major steps we needed to support this were all based on the API. Um, configuring the SMTP settings, that can be done through an API. Launching a cron job, a specific cron job, or the batch of all cron jobs, that can also be done through an API. All you need is API access. In some discussions about this, we kicked around OAuth. Uh, because that's a fairly popular way for setting up connections between uh, web applications. Unfortunately, I kept going through the specs, getting this feeling that something was a little bit off, but I couldn't quite adapt it to the way the city community works. And I think I've, I figured out why that is, um, at least at a, a 30,000 foot level. Uh, OAuth originates with services like Google Apps, Facebook, Twitter, these are very large data providers, right? You send your data to Facebook and they are the custodian for it. They do the app review, they host the page where you approve the applications, and they store the data, right? They are responsible for the full stack. Whereas in typical SIVI deployments, organizations want to control their data. They want their own installation that has their own private database that's separate from everyone else's database. The administrator on the city site exercises their own judgment about when to enable a connection um, to a remote app. Um, and there isn't really this one mega arbiter who can manage all of the security for you. About the closest we can come is some kind of review process for vetting the service providers to make sure that they are real businesses, that they have something that does in fact work with city CRM, um, and so on. So, I see this as a three-legged architecture. With the city CRM sites, cityCRM.org offering up the listing of sites, of services, and then various application providers, uh, like the email service. What does that mean? Uh, specifically, city CRM sites can send city CRM sites can send a message to cityCRM.org asking for a list of available services. They ask for the public keys of those services, um, and cityCRM.org does some review process and decides what to return. The listing is signed cryptographically by cityCRM.org. It's public information, so it only needs to be signed. Anyone can have access to it. it so we only do a signature. Once the site has a list of available services, the admin says, I want to use the Acme mail, or I want to use somebody's address cleanup service. Uh, they take that public key, and they use the public key to connect directly to the application. When they make the connection, they establish a shared secret. Uh, and the shared secret will be used for all subsequent communication. Um, and when they make that connection, they get a chance to review the required permissions 
and configure CDCRM to accept API calls subject to those permissions. In this case, there can be real data flowing through the connections. Uh, so we want to properly encrypt that. You know, we can use a combination of RSA and AES, which are, is a very common pattern for encrypting uh, data. Questions before I move on? Uh, technologically, the stack is made up of about three components. City CRM, which you know runs SaveTheWhales.org, Dolphin Action Committee, and I, I haven't actually heard of HuntWhales.org. They tend to be more for-profit operations, so I, they probably wouldn't use City. Uh, and then we have the service providers, like an address cleanup service, an email service, uh, an SMS service. And both of those applications build on top of a PHP library called CityCRM, CXN, RPC. So if someone wants to set up a new application, uh, they can take that library and build it uh, with their own framework, whether it's Symfony or Drupal or anything PHP-based. Or they can take CXN app and extend it. During the... Um, sort of the security vetting uh, of this system. There was a lot of back and forth over the use of HTTPS. On the one hand, HTTPS is great because there's been a lot of attention put into HTTPS. And um, there are a lot of people who understand it. However, among city sites, there are also a lot of people who have badly configured sites, where they have experimental sites, evaluation sites, training sites, that haven't actually been set up um, with certificates because getting a certificate is a bit of a to-do administratively. You have to pay an annual fee to, for the certificate, etc. And we need to set a slightly higher bar. We can't assume that HTTPS is providing all of the security. I do believe that all the connections should go over HTTPS. I think that's the, the default uh, for the services that I've been working on. But it's not a strict requirement that everything go over HTTPS. There is sufficient crypto on top of that that it would still be secure without it. HTTPS does still add value, um, forward secrecy, that sort of thing. But basically, my view is we degrade gracefully in the absence of HTTPS. I'm also a little bit nervous about solely relying on HTTPS because you have to rely on the public certificate uh, infrastructure. And if you look at any web browser, there are 100 or 200 certificate authorities all around the world um, which are issuing these certificates. And I don't know, this past year has, has had some fairly prominent news stories about certificates that have been falsely issued and have been caught by things like Chinese uh, proxy services <coughs> intercepting Google traffic. Um, it's very hard to establish trust solely based on the public certificate architecture. So when you're using HTTPS, you, you will take advantage of the public certificate architecture, but that alone is not sufficient to secure a connection. We also have a certificate authority for CivicCM.org, um, which mostly uh, gets its security by being off the grid. It's a very small CA that is very well hidden. It, and you can access it online. More details, the connection app and the RPC library are both available on GitHub. It's all open source stuff. And that's about it for now. Yes? Uh, have you had much interest from third parties about uh, integrating this uh, other than the SNCP, uh, are there any other things that might, right. might come up? So we talked about it a bit at um, one of the sprints a few months ago, and there was definitely a lot of interest among the partners that we talked about it with. Uh, we haven't been entirely confident about what kind of rules to put in terms of who gets in, like what services are available. So I think that that's kind of been 
our fault for holding back a bit. We also want to do a, uh, a sort of controlled study with one or two basic applications, just to make sure that the system is working. Um, and the two applications that we started on, the first one is a generic prompt service. So you turn that on and it will give you some advice about which cron jobs should be active and it will call them every hour uh, and send email if the cron jobs are failing. Uh, the second one is an anonymized site profile. So if you go into JIRA and you file uh, an issue about something not working, there's a lot of cases where that's because of something in the configuration of the site. Unfortunately, you can't file all of your site information in JIRA because that's a little sensitive and people can take that and try to optimize their attacks against your site. Um, so the idea with the anonymized profile is that we extract as many details as we can. We take out any information relating to particular paths or host names or databases, um, strip that out, and then put it into a web page where it can be shared in different support channels. So it's not just JIRA. It's also Stack Exchange, the forums, IRC, et cetera. Yeah? What, what if suppliers who you want to become part of this aren't interested in the forum? <coughs> uh, there is certainly the possibility that the core team could do the implementation on some of these. I think that perhaps a, an ideal model that takes advantage of uh, the strengths and weaknesses of different folks in the ecosystem would be to have the core team involved in developing some of the integration and then have somebody else running it. Uh, I think that it's a much easier sell um, to get somebody running it if they know that they've got support. How does it handle if um, two services require the same sort of permissions? So if you've connected two services that could potentially modify the same setting, is there anything to catch that? There isn't, the, except the, for the soft review process, where um, in order to get a, uh, a site listed, you have to send a summary with the list of required permissions, and we could detect that two different services are accessing the same setting. For most things like you know, mailings and contacts and phone numbers, uh, there isn't actually much conflict that you have with these services. Yeah, Sorry, I yeah. Um, so when you can, uh, so when you're sending installation commits to the service, the service sends back what settings it wants to change and what it wants to change them to. So the name of the SNTP host, username and password, that sort of thing. Exactly. And you have um, a fairly tight ability to audit what it does. It's uh, it was kind of fun working on. Some of this implementation. Um, you know, I find that the way we manage API keys in Civi is a bit difficult. Um, so uh, this has a, a new kind of API key that gets set up automatically, and it has the, the whitelisting rules, where it takes a table and it parses out the API request and compares it against the table of permissions. It's good to write. It's also potentially usable in other integration scenarios, uh, but right now it's only being used for some effect. Yeah? You mentioned the, C the CIVI CRM CA key. Yes. Is it, is it a public trusted group now, or would you have to import it? Uh, so it is bundled with CIVI CRM, right? It, it's not something where every web server has to be configured to use that public key, or yeah, use that certificate. And in fact, that's 
part of the reason why we have two layers with the HTTPS and also having some crypto in the payload. Um, because it's very hard to configure servers properly to use the various certificates if you want to use custom certificates. Um, but this way we can provide something that works out of the box. Other services that we've been kicking around, uh, I, in the, the lightning talks there was mention about the GSOC projects. One of the GSOC projects was an email preview service where you need to set up some servers that can simulate a web browser or simulate an email client in order to get a, a full rendering of how an email would look if it were displayed in Gmail. Setting up those servers is kind of a pain to do. The GSOC project does include those servers, but it's a pain to do. So it would be better if we could have one service that's sort of prepared and already has them running. It's not quite worth the effort for one small organization to set those up by themselves. All right. I guess I had a pretty quick presentation. Any more questions? So let me ask this. Does anybody look at this model and think that's horribly offensive? Civic CRM should not be listing uh, email providers or listing uh, RON providers or this kind of integration is part of the application. I feel the, I feel the opposite. I think it would be good that we are sort of making the city CRM and able to be opened up when people want it to be, so yeah. people who can build integrations with it. And I think that can only be a good thing for the city CRM ecosystem. If you're encouraging people to build services people can use within the CRM. Yeah, much the same. Uh, I think you know, as long as it's not Restricting it so you can only do right. the services that from Civic CRM, then yeah. But otherwise, yeah, it's a good thing. And, and I I think that's yeah that's the perfect frame right? because I, I I work on Civic CRM because I want to work on open source and I want something that's free and I like the fact that it's um, flexible and has all this loose coupling and you can plug in any anything you want basically. Um, I I would not be happy if the only way. Uh, to customize so they were to go through some kind of central arbiter, but um, I think we, we absolutely keep the current approach to a lot of these things where you can go in and put in an SMTP host and put in your own uh, SMS key and all that. Would this also be sort of accessible for extensions to make use of? Something uh, like, say, that yeah, if you use MailChimp, for example. And the extension there needs to go and do the same sort of setup business. So there are a couple ways to uh, link extensions and Civic Connect. Uh, in some discussions I've seen, the, it was suggested that we combine the administration screen so that you list the connections alongside the extensions. And it, it so like you might do a search for Mailchimp, and it doesn't quite matter if it's a connection or an extension. Um, Ideally, in keeping with our open architecture, I think connections should be restricted to using the API. If you can't actually configure the connection through the API, that means we're missing some functionality in core. Um, in practice, there probably are cases where we're missing a small piece of functionality, so someone needs to do an extension. You can resolve that a couple ways. One is to grant API access to install the extension. So they enable the connection, then the service comes back and says, you need to install this extension. Uh, that will be something that you can see when you're reviewing the required permissions, because mm -hmm. uh, they're requesting it. Another way you can go about it is, in terms of automating the setup of a new site, there is an API available for working with City Connect. So you can enable a connection and disable a connection through the API. Okay. Are 
Are there any other services that you folks think would be good services to run through this? Like if you had, you know, the top three things that are maybe a pain point in setting up city? Which part? P postal. Postal, yes. So like uh, if you want to do a blast of physical mail to your constituents. Mm -hmm. uh, to look up postal codes? Oh, to look up postal codes. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. You should consider talking to Stetler about uh, any data yeah. protection issues that might come about. So one set of issues, of course, is going to be the national boundary issues, that some organizations don't want their data going across national lines. Um, and I see that actually as an argument for the core team working with partners, because there are partners in many different locations. And if we have one set of software, they can run the service, but it maybe has one version for Germany and another version for the US. Uh, and depending on where your site has been deployed, we link it up with the appropriate provider. That would be my idea. But I agree, that is a good person talking about that. Would you like to identify the jurisdiction that each service is in when you're looking at the list of services? Because different providers are going to be offensive to different causes. Yes. Um, and I think right now we can do that just in the description, mm -hmm. right? the, either in the title of the service or in the footer of the description. It's a slightly yeah. separate thing, um, but in some ways going back to Bjorn's thing yesterday, uh, the, the bit you've got there in terms of the sort of authorization of particular bits of the API, uh, really was a sort of tie up between those two. Tie up between. So, so, so as I understood what you're doing there, you're able to say this particular application or, uh, or so this, this API key yesterday. can access these particular API functions. Uh, which is very much the same sort of thing as we're doing on the firewall side of things. Yes, uh, yes. Proxy, sorry. Um, there's maybe a tie between those two. Uh, and I'd really like to show you the, the whitelist rule class that we're using internally for that because it definitely takes a bit of work to parse the API call correctly. You have to deal with chaining, for example. Um, someone, you can't just look at the top level of the API call. Thank you.